Hey everyone, this is Lucas Banyo, an investor at Village Global, and I'm here with my co-host Ian Cinnamon. Welcome to Solar Punk. In this podcast, we cover topics related to space and defense and discuss how technology can contribute to a better and safer world. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global Solar Punk. We're excited to bring another very exciting conversation for you today. Mo Islam is the co-founder of Payload, one of the leading digital media companies in the aerospace industry. Prior to Payload, Mo was a senior member of the Deutsche Bank and JP Morgan's institutional wealth platform, where he raised strategic capital for growth stage technology companies across aerospace, ag tech, biotech, and renewable energy. Mo is also an active investor in the frontier tech community. Mo, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lucas. Ian, great to be here. Very excited. Awesome. So, Mo, can you tell us a little bit more about Payload? Why start a media company uh, covering space? Uh, so I'm, I'm in New York right now, and, and I was talking to one of the largest media organizations in uh, was a strategy person um, at one of the largest media organizations today, and they asked me that same question. And uh, it was interesting to see how much more of a, um, a focus that some of the largest media companies in the world are taking on space. But we'll get to that later. But to answer your question... So Payload, um, as you mentioned, it's a digital media company um, covering the business and policy of the space industry. I co-founded the company um, now about two years ago, technically two years ago. I don't think we actually incorporated to, for, for another year after that. But it, you know, the, per, the reason why we started it was really for two reasons. One, which was to um, bridge a gap in the industry regarding media coverage and bring a... Um, and, and then I think the second reason is really to bring a fresh new perspective and culture to a very, very traditional industry. And... Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, media is not new, space media is not new, but the distribution model that we've taken and the approach that we've taken is new. Um, and because um, m- mainly because, you know, I saw kind of from my prior, prior background, what was happening on the investing side of the space um, economy. Um, and my co-founder Ari was able to kind of put two and two together around what was happening in the, the larger kind of media um, side of, 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 of the industry, which was that most of space media was still very traditional. Meanwhile, you had the likes of like Axios and Morning Brew um, build newsletter first distribution models. And that effectively, um, you know, we, we took the bet that that was sort of the future of what the industry wanted. Um, and that's what we ultimately went after. And it ended up where it has been so far, I'll knock on wood, been working out fairly well. And on a, a more personal level, like what drew you into like the overall market makes sense, but like what gets you excited about this? About media or space or both? Space, space. <laughs> why space? Not just media. Why space in particular within media? Well, well, I'll take a step back. Right, I have a very kind of non-traditional background. Um, I spent most of my career on Wall Street, um, and you know, my first job, um, one of my first jobs coming out of school, was on a trading desk. And it was really focused on uh, covering technology companies, and you know, I spent a lot of time on China. But eventually, eventually, I moved over to um, work more on kind of the private market side, and space was an area that I spent a lot of time on. Um, it was something that I've always been passionate about as as, as a kid. Um, you know, in school, I was actually going to study um, physics and astrophysics, and I wanted to work for NASA. That was always part of the part of the dream. But I had a roommate that convinced me otherwise that the glamour of New York is actually in investment banking, not in uh, anything else. And I uh, and I effectively sold my soul, and I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, and then I uh, I joined uh, I joined J.P. Morgan, and then I very quickly realized that I'd made a mistake, <laughs> and um, I realized that my place in the industry might be on the financing side, um, which is where I spend most of my time. But then ultimately realized that there was a greater um, impact that I could make um, when it came to. Um, when it came to sort of the broader space economy and like helping people understand what's happening because the mainstream media for the most part hasn't been covering what's happening very well and i think that's that that was really what ultimately drove me to the industry awesome so mo wh- wh- when you look back over the last couple of years that you spent really analyzing the the industry where do you think we are in the growth slash maturity curve of of the of the space e- economy and maybe give us a little bit of the hi- history as well Sure. Um, I would say that uh, there's no doubt that we are in the early stages of the space economy right now, right? And I'll use just a few examples, but even if you just think about Starship, right? SpaceX's Starship, their heavy lift launch vehicle that's going to be fully reusable and, and rapidly um, rapidly launched. You know, and a lot of folks talk about how this is going to change the mass design and volume constraints of space companies. Um, that's not yet operational, right? Right. 
Um, and we haven't also seen sort of a mass proliferation of this new iterative, you know, first principles based engineering um, across the industry, right? So Starship is like a really, really good example of, you know, designed to build um, in three years while, while removing most of the major risks. It's a true, like a true engineering feat, right? When you look at where it was in 2019 versus where it is today, right? Fully stacked. The last time we saw such an efficient kind of machine was in the Apollo era, right? Where we went from blueprint to launch to the moon in six years, right? By the Saturn V. I think since then we've gone through this like kind of en these endless political machinations. And now we have an SLS rocket that's been in the design phase and build phase for the last 10 years, still having a lot of issues, right? And I think for the first time in detail, and it's this is very fresh in my mind, which is why I'm talking about it. NASA today in a press conference actually acknowledged Starship um, today in a, in, a, in a pretty significant way. And I've never actually seen them do that before, right? As part of like the Artemis, um, Artemis launch. But this is all to say that we haven't yet seen a mass proliferation of that type of design and engineering. And we haven't landed back on the moon. We haven't built commercial space stations. There's so much more growth and kind of cost reduction, market building that's yet to happen, right? So there's no question that we're still very much in the early phases of that. But to go into the, I mean, look, his, history of space, like, I mean, there's so much we can talk about. Um, and I'll try to like, see how I can summarize that within a few minutes. I think it also, I mean, I think the start of the industry really just depends on who you ask. Um, some would say it's when, um, I'm trying to remember his name, I think it's Constant, Constantine Chalovsky, Ch Ch um, who first published the rocket equation that effectively, you know, the most important governing equation to rocket design. Some might say it's that. Some might say it's when Robert Goddard fired the first liquid propelled rocket engine and made it 40 feet. Personally, I think that the 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 space age really started with the V2 and von Braun. Um, this was back, obviously, during um, Nazi Germany and during World War II. Um, and you know, the uh, Werner von Braun, the German um, scientist, built the V2 rocket, and it was the first rocket to ever reach suborbital space. Right, it was around 100 um, 100 uh, 100 mile altitude. Um, but of course, the V2 was used for killing people. Um, and then Von Braun eventually came over to the States to help build our um, rocket program in exchange for amnesty. Um, but to me, like that's really when the space age started. Then you had like obviously Sputnik and I think 57. Um, and that effectively kicked off the space race between um, the US and the Soviets. Um, we had the first man um, that ever um, went to orbit, which was Yuri Gagarin. And then a month later, we had Alan Shepard. Um, and then, of course, we had the Apollo era, right? And that was the um, what we've just been talking about, right? Just immensely efficient, um, politically coordinated effort to reach the moon. And you know, at the time, I think government budgets um, or the the NASA budget was at like a four percent, like all time high. And if you just kind of, kind of comp that to where it is today, it's like zero point four percent, right? A whole magnitude lower. And, uh, you know, I think then, you know, you went into multiple phases, right? You, you know, you had situations where, you know, um, or you had, uh, we built space stations, we built Skylab, and then we built Mir, or not we, but the Soviet Union built Mir. And then we had the ISS, and then you had the shuttle era, right? And then the shuttle era was really built, the shuttle was really, you know, designed and built for the International Space Station, and it was part of the International Space Station build. But it was also supposed to be this reusable launch vehicle, and it was supposed to be low cost, and that never happened, and ended up being extremely expensive. And I think ultimately the shuttle era is what, you know, propels us to where we are today, which was like, you know, policy and cost, significant policy and cost driven changes that have allowed space to proliferate in the way it has, right? Um, policy wise, I'm sure you guys have talked about this in detail before, right? COTS, the COTS program, commercial orbital transportation services spearheaded by Mike Griffin that allowed commercial companies to actually bid um, for contracts um, against so, um, the older players. Um, and of course, the cost-driven changes that SpaceX has brought on, right? Two huge drivers of why the space economy is proliferating the way it is today. Not to have you uh, go into, you know, another deep explanation, <laughs> but for all of our listeners, not everyone is an expert at space. And I think that background yeah. is probably incredibly helpful. But yeah. for the people who are listening, who are trying to get a better grasp on the current space economy, how do you break it down in your mind, right? We have, you know, launch, we have ground stations, we have satellites, we have buses, we have everything in between. How do you kind of break down all of these sectors within the space economy? Sure. And, 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 and I have an answer that's not mine, but I'll give. But actually, before I get into that, I, Ian, I actually realized I didn't answer one of your earlier questions, which is why is space important to me? And I'm just going to highlight that for like two seconds, because I think, I think my answer is slightly different than most. Um, and I think there's a lot of examples you can make about like, oh, it's like, you know, obviously there's significant value to society and we can talk about what that is. And, um, you know, and, and sort of our everyday lives and GPS and trillions of dollars of, you know, new value that's been created over time. But I think 
to me, the most important thing is, you know, we humans, right, by nature are explorers. And if you actually look at the history of civilization, we push forward because of our curiosity to kind of go that extra mile um, and, and sort of go beyond the line of sight um, or sort of, you know, where the horizon ends, right? And if we if we didn't do that, there's no, there's no, there's no question we wouldn't have survived as long as we have. And, you know, we now live in a culture where the majority of people um, and younger people, right, they want to be influencers and build cat JPEGs, right? So um, Robert Zubrin said it the best. And if you guys haven't, I'm sure you guys have read him, but for those on those listening that haven't read Robert Zubrin, I'd highly recommend him. He's a NASA scientist, engineer, and, and he's one of the guys who inspired Elon to go and build SpaceX. But, you know, he thinks that we have to go to Mars because the cost that it will cost, the, 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 the amount that it will cost us to go to Mars will be repaid multiple times over, maybe even exponentially so, by the sheer amount of um, young engineers, scientists, and, and, um, and just mathematicians that it will create, because how inspirational it'll be, right? And we haven't had that moment since the Apollo era. So that's, to me, like, it's just hugely progressive and important to society, right? Which is why I think, like, space at the end of the day, like, that's why we built Payload, right? That's why we built this company, because we think that the mainstream media does not paint the right stories, right? It's not about billionaires traveling to, um, you know, low Earth orbit. It's, it's, it's far bigger than that. That's, uh, I have to admit, a take uh, articulated in that way that I have not quite heard before, and I love it. That's, I mean, <laughs> thank you, Mo, for explaining that. Yes. But no, I think, um, so, so the best categorization that I've seen is actually by Anton Brevde at Prime Movers Lab. Um, and he um, summarized it really, really well in in a um, in one of his reports that I that I remember seeing. But it's basically he categorizes the the industry into kind of three main buckets, right? There's like the space for Earth companies, so companies that generate revenue from Earth based customers. Um, there's space for space, and that's when you're thinking, you know, when you're generating revenues from space based assets or customers that are kind of within the orbit of Earth. So you can think of like you know, in-orbit propulsion, um, space tug, solar power, um, energy for space-based assets. And then, of course, his third category is like beyond Earth, which is um, more of like the science fiction type category of kind of commercial activity that occurs well beyond the bounds of Earth um, and beyond the orbits of Earth, right? So interplanetary colonization and exploration, mining, planetary infrastructure. And I think those three, like to me, like that's like the best way that I think you can kind of think about and bucket different companies. And, th- and there's other ways that people have done it. People have done it based on like orbit, like low earth orbit and medium earth and, and geo and, you know, where companies fit within that. But I think the simplest way to understand for me, at least, has been those three buckets of so space for earth, space for space, and then beyond earth. So so tell us, where do you think there is the most opportunity uh, in, in the space economy right now? Um, that's a good question. I assume you mean from an investment perspective. Yes, yes. Look, there's a lot. You know, I, I would love to plug Ian's company Apex, but uh, that's a great place to start. But um, in the interest of fairness, I'll, 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 I'll talk about something different. I think that in a really, really interesting area um, of the market where there's a lot of, I think, near term and long term value is around commercial space stations. I think there's a lot of naysayers about sort of the business model viability. I, I, I strongly think that there's gonna, it's going to be a very significant part of the space uh, economy. And I think it ultimately comes down to cost feasibility. And if most people, I think it's easy to just Google, like, how much did it cost to build the ISS? And I think the number that comes up is $150 billion if you did if you actually were to Google that, which um, in and of itself is actually incorrect because of that $150 billion, $50 billion of that is actually space shuttle cost to build and design and, and, and develop the space shuttle. And it's often ascribed to the ISS costs, um, which I mean, in, in a way you can, I guess you can attribute it to it, but the ISS really in and of itself costs $100 billion to build, which is a huge, huge number. And if you actually look at current estimates on like the newer commercial space stations, you're looking at like single digit percentages of that budget. And, um, you know, that may be unbelievable com- thinking that you could build a space station for $5 billion when it once cost $100 billion. But um, the example that I would always give folks, right, is if you actually keep in mind that NASA actually predicted that the cost for them to build the Falcon 9 would be about $4 billion, right? And obviously, SpaceX did it at something like a tenth of that cost, right? It was like four or five hundred million bucks. So um, to me, um, you know, I think that there's a really interesting um, market um, for kind of and, and sort of um, I think that commercial space stations can be extremely viable, especially if you can figure out the cost issue. And I think when Starship does become operational, um, I think that that reality becomes even stronger. 
And, you know, if you look at like what's happening, I mean, it's, it's particularly interesting today because China launched the, um, the last module of the space station, Tiangong, right? So they just launched it today. And right now, so you have China's space station that's going to be um, pretty much ready to go um, very soon. Um, and then we have no, there's no government plans in the Western world, right, to build a successor. And you've, you know, obviously, as a result, you've seen this like mass proliferation of companies like Lockheed and Axiom and Blue Origin and Sierra Space, all submitting proposals and, and, and raising significant amounts of capital to build these stations. And I think the bulk of that initial revenue for all those companies is going to come from those government dollars, right? Most, most governments, especially the US has codified in, in congressional directives that they need, um, they want to have a sustained human presence in low Earth orbit. But anyway, without getting to all the details, there's a, there's a ton of revenue streams that are exist today that can be captured by those space stations. But then there's a ton of like call option upside for um, you know industries that we don't even we don't even know like you know what what those look like, right? But I so I think space stations are really interesting, like lunar like our low Earth orbit infrastructure. All right, so I, I, the obvious question that has to be asked is, which one do you think will be operational first? There's a <laughs> lot of commercial space stations out there. You got, you got, you got to pick one. So, all right, let's let's. Well, there's crude and then there's uncrewed, right? I think there's very, it's very possible, and I know, and and I know there's a few companies in stealth right now that are looking at uncrewed space stations. Like th- those could easily be, those could easily kind of come out of nowhere and and uh, and 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 take that throne. And it's obviously there's totally different constraints to in design when you're building uncrewed versus crewed, of course. If you're talking about crewed stations, I'm going to try really hard to be unbiased because I'm actually invested in a, 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 a couple of these companies. <laughs> if, I, if I just look at the facts, there's Axiom that um, plans to launch their first module in 2024. I think their advantage is that they have, um, they've already sent a private crew to the ISS back in 20, um, earlier this year, back in April. Um, and I think that that's, um, that's obviously a huge leg up to know, like, you know, to gather that data of like how you can manage the, uh, the astronaut side of the, of the, um, of the, of the space station model. Um, you have an orbital reef, um, which of course is Blue Origin Sierra Space. Um, and their advantage is that they have um, Dream Chaser, right, as the cargo, um, um, as the ca- cargo provider and crew, 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 crew provider as well, actually. Um, but also they have the new Glenn. So I would say those two feel at the moment based on just like what we're seeing and hearing as like the front runners. Obviously, there's also Star Lab, which is Lockheed and Voyager. And they have, I think they have their own cost advantage, right? It's, the station build is actually smaller than the other two. Um, and you have Northrop, but Northrop, Northrop's like, no one really knows much about Northrop is what I would say. Like they've been pretty like uh, lock and key about their, their, their model. So I would say two front rudders feel like it's, it's got to be orbital reef and axiom for the time being. All right. Very, very helpful overview. So I think one of the fascinating things about the ISS is all, not just fascinating, but amazing things is all of these countries have come together to collaborate on it. In the opposite ones, though, I think over the last couple of years, we've seen a increase increased number of threats of ASATs and actual uh, launches of ASATs. What's your take on the evolution of that and the impact that will have on the commercial space industry? I'll say two things, right? Because you're, uh, you're, you're alluding a little bit to like the space race or like space race 2.0. Um, but, you know, I think that if you look back to the 60s, right, um, you had, there's only two space programs, the US and the Soviets. Today, there's about 80. And they're all looking to achieve economic return, right? So huge increase. Now, if you actually peel back the onion and you, and you, and you, and you ask yourself who are actually the, the, the ones that are making the most progress, um, it's obviously U.S., it's obviously Russia, and it's obviously China. Um, and, you know, if, if, if the, the question of like, you know, are we in a, a space race? Like, I, I think there's no doubt. I like definitely, except this time, it's, you know, Western democracy um, versus, you know, totalitarian um, states overseas, right? And I think you have, um, if you just look at the facts, right, you have Russia who threatened their work on the ISS, and that keeps extending. I think they're now, they, they basically have said they're good till 2027. You know, you have the head of the Russian space agency effectively threatening the life of Elon after what he did, um, you know, supplying Starlink service to Ukraine. Um, China's partnering with Russia um, on lunar research stations on, um, you know, and these are countries that are also performing ASAT tests, like you said, and they also don't, they don't really care about the debris that they're creating and sort of that collateral damage. 
So post that launch we were talking about for Tiangong, there's already reports that that Long March 5, like um, first stage, is going to come back down to earth in the coming week or two. And then we just went through this like not that long ago, right? Months ago. So, but there's just basically no, it's just like, I, I don't even want to say, I don't want to go as far as to say it's like a we don't care approach, but there is a little bit of like lack of responsibility in that kind of thing, right? Which is a huge problem. Um, and then outside of that, obviously the, the Russia-Ukraine like conflict has created a lot of kind of deglobalization. You've had, you know, Russia refusing to launch satellites for companies like OneWeb that happened earlier this year. Engine sales, right? Russia announced it's going to be discontinuing rocket engine sales to the US, the RD-180 and the RD-181, like no longer, I mean, if, you know, Firefly, uh, excuse me, Northrop Grumman um, uses it for their Antares. They needed to now partner with Firefly to do to, to kind of um, continue the Antares launch vehicle. Um, you know, a lot of other companies have had these issues, right? So like there's been, like you've mentioned, you know, tech in general has been, you know, all about globalization, but now within the aerospace and defense industry, it all feels like deglobalization and like onshoring of supply chain, onshoring of production, onshoring of all these capabilities. There's no question you're going to start seeing more and more of that. And what are, what are areas of, of this economy that you think are overhyped and underhyped? Um, yeah, so uh, underhyped. Uh, I'm going to go with a contrarian bet on this one. I'm going to say underhyped is launch. Um, so I think that... That's the first um, time anyone says that. <laughs> I know. I, I know, but I have some thoughts on why. This isn't just a, this isn't playing devil's advocate for the sake of playing devil's advocate. I think, I think common things you hear about launch, right? You hear that it's uninvestable. There's too many companies out there. And usually when I hear that, I ask a pretty simple question, which is, okay, how many commercial companies have a launch vehicle that are actually, that have actually made it to orbit? Right. That's question number one. And let's just look at the US market, right? Like how many, you know, companies have made it to orbit. You can count that number in your in your right hand. And then if you actually add the additional layer of like how many of those companies actually have a payload capacity that's economically viable, right? You realize that it cuts that number down even further. Right. Now I'd argue 300 kilograms, 500 kilograms, that doesn't actually work long term. You don't even have the propellant capacity to actually come back and be reusable. Um, and you don't have the you don't have the payload capacity to be long term viable, which is why all these companies that have even made it to orbit that have come back and said, just kidding, like we need something bigger, right? We need something 10 times bigger, 15 times bigger. Right. So I think the opportunity to capture market share in launch is still very exciting. Now you might say, okay, what about Starship? And that's totally fair. And I don't know, like it's very possible that Starship completely eats everyone's lunch. But I think the reason why it doesn't is because like I, I know for a fact that Starship is behind schedule and there's a lot of issues that they're having, but they're gonna figure it out. But when Starship comes online, it's going to be used to serve Starlink. And Starlink V2, version 2 of Starlink, does not work in its current form with the Falcon 9. Now, they have like different configurations that they're trying to launch it. But at scale, it's certainly not going not to work. So the first few years of Starship is going to be launching Starlink, right? Until it's finally commercially viable, right, for customers. I think that's like three, four, five years away, maybe even six years away before like you have company. And, and that's also, that creates its own problem, right? Because there's a lot of startups now that are raising money based on star, Starship, right? Which in and of itself is a, is a whole problem, especially if you get that funding cycle wrong. So, you know, I think launch is um, underhyped. Um, I think overhyped, I think just to kind of keep with that theme is probably satellite broadband outside of Starlink. Um, I think um, outside of Starlink, it's gonna be a very challenging market. You know, OneWeb and Kuiper, everyone that comes after, because if you actually look back in the 90s, like during the era of like satellite kind of systems in the 90s, you know, the um, Iridiums and the Teledesics of the world, um, there were effectively like three key issues that caused failures in those companies. Um, one, which was high CapEx. Um, the second, which was um, actual market demand risk. And I think the third was really like the fact that there was like this proliferation of terrestrial um, 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 substitutes that were just far better, right? So if you actually just look at Starlink, right? Starlink doesn't have that CapEx issue because they have the captive launch demand. Um, they have um, the market demand risk, still a big question for sure. But I mean, you know, they're, they're adding about 50,000 subs a month. They'll probably end the year around 700 to 750,000 subs. That's a huge, 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 like they, they just have a huge advantage over in terms of like time versus all the other companies. And you might be able to say like, oh, well, well they can, they can, you know, Kuiper can come in and like, you know, cost cut or like they can like, you know, undercut them. But I don't see how that's possible because they're not, they don't have captive launch capacity. They're going out to others and they're paying much higher premium prices. And, and, and I think the final point is on the terrestrial innovation part, which is like the unknown that could change everything. But like, like right now, it doesn't look like that's the case. So to me, like Starlink is the front runner 
And I don't see how other companies are going to be able to compete in that broadband market, right? And there's a lot of companies that have come out and announced tens of thousands of constellation size satellites or satellite size constellations. I don't know. Is that a hot take? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, sure. I think there were like three or four hot takes in there. I think that was very <laughs> helpful. Um, I, I will say, I do think that we've been uh, both previously on the investing side and Lucas could chime in on that, but at least on the uh, kind of building a company side and seeing what people are using satellite buses for, I will say there is a lot of hype around the uh, kind of broad distribution of internet and communications, but it does feel saturated to say the least, right? And you have some yeah. very big players in the space, not just strong, but in Kuiper, right? Like that's, they're backed by a massive company and uh, going and competing with both Starlink and them is a uphill battle. Could be yeah, difficult. by the way, if Blue Origin had launched Kuiper, I would actually say it's possible that Bezos will just like fund it, right? Or I mean, that's a big <laughs> statement, but like it's possible. Amazon's a public yeah. company. We just yeah. we just saw what happened with Meta. When you make a yep. a a a huge capex investment, R and D investment into something that the market doesn't believe is will be economically profitable, your stock gets crushed. So Amazon, you only get so much growth. You only get so much rope. Amazon's eventually going to have to deal with that, right? So they're not going to be able to just say, "Oh, well, it's a, it's our, it's our loss leader." And maybe it is. Maybe, maybe there's another segment of Amazon's market that we can't even foresee, right? That they're like, you know what, Kuiper is always like they're maybe they're saying Kuiper will always be our loss leader, but it's going to add so much penetration to these other, you know, verticals. Like we don't know, but like at the current vantage, at my current vantage point, I don't see how they're going to be able to do it. So when we look at all of the new companies that I'm sure you've observed, and Lucas has definitely observed from the investing side, I, I see as well, I think there's a nice mix, right? You have some that are very logical business cases, some that feel like they're total science fiction, um, and everything in between. What's your take on this current set of uh, kind of new space companies? And especially in this macroeconomic environment where uh, you know the economy is not in the best place right now, what is that going to end up looking like? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that um, it's a very challenging market right now for really any companies where there's capex, right? Significant capex. I mean, we went from a very significant period of effectively zero cost of capital um, to now um, um, just quite just not that anymore, right? Companies now have to actually understand that uh, debt costs something, and like that's going to be um, that's going to be. Um, equated by investors into kind of what the long-term implication of that is for the for the company's growth, um, and within space, right? You saw you know last few years record amounts of capital being raised, which led to I believe speculation um, on products and services that require sort of one or two additional layers of the space economy to develop in order to achieve business model viability, right? So, um, for example, like if it's a satellite imaging business that can launch immediately and generate revenue because they have customers then great, right? That actually like, you know, there's a way that you can kind of like um, frame and raise capital for a business like that. But if you're, I don't know if you're building, I don't want to pick on any company, right? If you're, if you're building like gas stations in orbit, right? You need to have a pretty innovative business model to bridge yourself to the fact that like, Hey, like in order for that model to work, you not only need a pretty robust economy in, in orbit, but you need those companies to actually need your product, which could be even further away, right? In terms of years, right? Um, and I think that um, companies that can generate real revenue today from paying customers, obviously are the ones that have the best chance of navigating navigating this fundraising market. And if you fit into any of the other two uh, models, like the second or third order, like kind of layer, I think you're you're going to need you're going to need government contracts, right? You're going to need to convince the government that this is something that's extremely important and critical. Um, otherwise, I think it's going to be very, I think it's going to be very very challenging. And I think that you know what's happened in the SPAC market has not helped. Like you know, investment banks convinced companies to you know raise a lot of money and go public at these ridiculous 2025 revenue expectations, and these companies can't even hit like 50 percent of their 2022 revenue projections, right? So like, I mean, we don't have to get into that. We all know the SPAC um, market has been a disaster, but it does reverberate into the private markets, right? And it does have effects. Like great companies that otherwise would have raised at really great valuations are now being comped to their public market peers. And, or, or you know, maybe you're a great EO business, but like someone's like, hey, like your future like growth ceiling is 200 million based on like the market caps that we see out there, right? So it's obviously creating 
creating an issue there. So um, I think near term, that's going to be a challenge, but I think eventually the market's going to adjust and kind of figure out that like some of these companies may not have been economically viable to begin with. There might be some consolidation. We're already seeing that. Um, there was an investment today made in a company that's uh, that's a SPAC company, a large pr- um, investment from a prime. You know, if I were to predict that, that that's a company that's going to get taken over. So, you know, I think there's a lot of that that you're going to see in the near term. So, Mo, g- given all that, given all the companies that you talked about, all the different sectors, different spaces that we discussed within the within the industry, and of course, given your job of payload and talking to people about space all the time, 24-7, what do you think most people misunderstand most about the industry? Yeah, I would say, um, I, I think there's two kind of ways to answer that question. I think if you kind of look at the sort of mainstream, just taking the, just let's taking our kind of investor hat off for a second. Um, I think that one of the things, and it's part of the reason why we started Payload, right? I think it's like, um, what impact does activities in space um, actually have for Earth? And I think that's a question that I've received um, quite frequently from folks, especially when they hear about sort of like my involvement in space media. Why does it matter? And I think it's a huge challenge that the industry has, which is convincing like, you know, the citizens of Earth that this matters. And we haven't had that moment since the Apollo era. And I think it's a problem because it can sometimes like, you know, it can dictate political um, decisions and those political decisions have financing impacts on all the things that we do on the public and private side. But helping the sort of the broader citizens globally, right, understand um, why we need to invest in space, I think that's super critical. Um, you know, most people take um, you know GPS for granted, right? Space-based service, clearly, space-based service has created trillions of dollars of value. Um, you know, if, even if you just forget about the map side of GPS, right, the timing signal that GPS creates provides. You know, critical um, is, is, is like super critical for for ATM transactions, for um, you know um, point of sale transactions. You have weather data, you know climate data. Um, I think I, I was reading earlier that like over fifty percent of climate change variables can actually only be tracked by satellites in space, right? So everything that we know, like half of what we know about climate change, is because of what we've done in space, right? The Apollo program, like there's just so. There's so many spin-off technologies um, as it relates to um, our space program. And NASA actually has a website that you, you, I would encourage anyone who, who's interested to look at this, right? Water purification, air conditioning, surgical devices, ground collision avoidance systems. Like th- NASA has patents for all these things, right? And like you can see how insane it is the number of things that have been created as a result of like the work of NASA. And I think the other side, um, if I were to just bring it back to like, I think, I think the core of the conversation, which is around the investing side, I think what's misunderstood um, is I think what constitutes the space economy. I think there's a lot of confusion around that. Like, you know, some people include companies that are, um, that have any type of business model that's powered by space-based asset. Um, and I think that methodology can create confusion and it makes the industry look a little bit bigger than it is. And I think there's another methodology where it's like all assets where the central point of like value creation occurs actually in space um, and any earth building processes of building space-based systems and assets. That to me is like the most accurate in my mind, which gets you to like a like a 250 to $300 billion kind of space economy. So I, I think that that is misunderstood a little bit. Um, but I mean, obviously there's a lot of other things that I think, I think the investor community, I think what you guys are doing at Village Global, like you guys have done a really good job like um, understanding like what the investable pockets of the industry are. But let me tell you, I speak to a lot of investors that it's very clear that they just entered the industry. Not a lot of work was spent and, you know, they're making big bets. And ultimately like, you know, we know how those things turn out, but there is, you're going to see more of that, I'm sure. But there is definitely a level of misunderstanding that's present across the entire kind of investment landscape. Got it. Generalizing, of course. (laughs) Right, right. And to, to go back to, to what you said uh, about the, the space SPACs, um, made me think a, l- a little bit more about the, the broader uh, risks to the, econ- to, to the space economy. Is your view that most of the risks that, that pertain to space economy have to do with the macro? Or what, what are the other key risks that, that, that you think could really you know, bust the, the, the industry and all the excitement? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think you're kind of seeing that a little bit. Um, I do. I, I think that there has been some excitement that has collapsed as a result of what's happening on the space um, SPAC side. Um, but yeah, I think the near-term risk, like you said, is financing, right? I think it's we're in a rising rate environment. Inflation's picked up. 
um, quite significantly, right? And the market hates uncertainty, right? And when you're looking about companies that oftentimes are very capex heavy, you know, the market doesn't know, you know, the market wants to know if you're going to be able to get that next round of funding. So, um, you know, to me, I think it's, um, I, I do think it's just a near term issue. Um, I think the market, I mean, because everything happened so quickly, we went from like zero rate environment to like now, oh my God, where are rates going? We have no idea in the span of like six months. Like even if, even though it was somewhat well telegraphed, I mean, it was a shock to the system. And I think that shock to the system has allowed, you know, some capital to pull back. But so I think in the near term, I think you're going to see, so, you're, I think you're going to see folks like, you know, spend a lot more time thinking about sort of where to deploy capital. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I can keep turning back to the fact that like, there's still records amounts of VC dollars out there, PE dollars out there, just dollars that need to be put to work. Um, and I think once you have like one of these, what the next kind of seminal moment, everyone talks about the iPhone moment. I don't know what the iPhone moment in space is going to be. Um, I think it might be Starship, Starship launching, you know, and then landing first, first stage, second stage, both landing, like that might be the iPhone moment for the space industry. And, and that might drive a huge amount of more for, capital. For, into for the those industry. that don't know, what, why would that be this, the, the iPhone moment? To take a step back, right? The launch vehicle that took us to the moon is called the Saturn V, right? It was built by Von Braun, 100,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. And the Saturn V was fully expendable, right? And I don't know what it cost per launch, but it was a lot, definitely a lot. Starship is going to be the same size as Saturn V, if not maybe slightly bigger in terms of like design. And not only were the first stage land, but the second stage, which is oftentimes a harder part because you're actually in orbit at that time, traveling much faster. So like heat becomes an issue when you're actually trying to get the thing back to, to, to Earth. When you figure that out, you, you solve two key issues. You solve one, the, co- the huge cost issue, which is, which is the, the industry. Um, and I think the other issue you solve is um, cadence, right? Um, NASA actually just said today in their press conference that they believe that SpaceX can ge- produce a one Raptor engine a day. That's a huge manufacturing feat, huge manufacturing feat, right? So like Starship is going to solve reusability and it's going to solve launch cadence, right? So like that is going to open up a whole new like space economy, right? And I think that's going to drive in even more capital. There's no question. I mean, there's a reason. I mean, part of it is hype that SpaceX gets $125 billion valuation. But um, there's some truth to what it could become if it actually solves these issues. And, and, and I believe it will, because they have to. Elon has to solve this issue. If he doesn't, then Starlink doesn't work. If Starlink doesn't work, then SpaceX is worth you know a tenth or a fraction of what it's worth today. Mo, uh, for people that are interested in learning more and reading the work that you're doing at Payload, what's the best way to get in touch? What's the best way to, to, to read all the content that you're putting out? Yeah, so um, the easiest way is to just go to payloadspace.com um, and you can sign up for our newsletter. It comes out every day. Um, and our editorial team, um, Ryan, Ryan Duffy, Jess Liss, Rachel Zisk, and Jacqueline Felcher have done an amazing job putting that together. So everything from business to policy to finance, like a lot of great stuff there. Um, and if anyone ever has questions, you can feel to you can feel free to reach out to, to me directly at mo at payloadspace.com, or you can reach out to the team. It's just general at payloadspace.com. And we're always happy to field questions and talk to anyone who's interested in the industry. Awesome. Well, uh, Mo, th- thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Lucas, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.